Thank you everyone for having me. Um, I look to forward to chatting to you about uh, the conservation of South Africa's rarest snake eagle. Um, so first off, just to give you an overview of our organization, um, I work for BirdLife South Africa, uh, and we are the only uh, NGO uh, that's focused specifically on conserving birds in their habitat in South Africa. Uh, and we do this through a range of scientifically based programs. Um, we're also part of the BirdLife International Partnership, and this is the biggest conservation partnership in the world, uh, and it uh, has up to 120 country partners, um, so quite a, quite a big uh, partnership, uh, and this partnership allows us to disseminate uh, all our work throughout that network, which uh, allows us to have both a regional and an international impact. And it also allows us to learn uh, from these other country partners. So first off, just to shock and awe, uh, this is just uh, to show you the range of uh, beautiful and interesting characters uh, we have here in South Africa uh, regarding raptors. Uh, so I'll start the talk with just a small overview of raptors uh, in South Africa and further afield. Um, and we're quite lucky uh, in South Africa, if you look sort of at global species diversity, we rank quite highly. Uh, so it's a good place to be for raptor enthusiasts such as myself. Um, yeah, but unfortunately raptors aren't doing that well. Uh, this, these graphs are from a paper by McClure et al. Uh, and in the top left there, you can see uh, the percentage of species in each conservation status or threat category. Uh, now, that refers basically to a category uh, that is assigned by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Um, and it's pretty much a barometer for how likely it is that a species will go extinct. So everything from vulnerable upwards um, means that there's a danger for the species to go extinct with critically endangered, meaning that uh, the species is bound to go extinct if drastic action isn't taken, basically. And you can see at the far left there, um, if we look at all raptor species uh, up here uh, in this column here, you'll see that almost a quarter of species are threatened with extinction. Um, but if we look uh, just below that, uh, we'll see that even though only a quarter are threatened with extinction, uh, more than half have declining populations. And just to note for those who aren't aware, we're experiencing an African vulture crisis you can see that more than half of the species are threatened with extinction. Um, and this is due to a range of threats, um, or there's a range of threats that threaten raptors uh, across the board. Uh, two of the big ones being agriculture and logging, which leads to uh, habitat loss, uh, as well as in energy in infrastructure, such as collisions with power lines or wind infrastructure, uh, which you'll hear about next week. Um, as well as electrocutions. And the reason I highlight those two is because they are um, going to be touched on later in the talk again. So um, just looking at uh, sort of uh, Southern Africa, um, BirdLife South Africa has uh, produced this publication, the 2015 ESCOM Red Data Book uh, of Birds, and it's a regional assessment of the conservation status of species within the region. Um, and uh, what we learned from this is basically that raptors in Southern Africa aren't faring uh, any different from those globally. You can see of the 80 species we have, 22 are threatened with extinction, uh, six of which are critically endangered. Uh, four of those are vulture species, but two of those are actually raptors uh, that I work on, uh, one being the Taita falcon, and the other being our guest of honor this evening, uh, the southern banded snake eagle which is that beautiful bird on the left um, and to start off with i'm just gonna give you an overview of its biology as well as ways to identify it uh, starting with its call i hope you guys could hear that um, sounds a bit like a majestic chicken um, but in any case that's that's its call uh, and now if you look at its plumage, 
you'll see that uh, first year birds have this nice pale coloring, quite attractive, uh, I have to say. But then in the second year, they uh, change into plain old brown snake eagles. Um, but luckily, when they reach sub-adulthood, they start getting some of that barring. And when they're adult, uh, that's their plumage there. Also diagnostic is they have a double white band on, um, on their tails. And that is actually also a part of where their scientific name com comes from, as well as the Afrikaans name, which is a double bun slung arum. Um, and this species is a forest specialist. Uh, so they, their habitats are mostly these coastal dune forests that you can see on the screen there. Uh, in South Africa, that habitat is mostly within the Indian Ocean coastal belt, which is this blue strip down here. And for those who don't know, the biome is, you can think of it as a habitat type that's uh, characterized by the dominant vegetation. But if we look further afield, the species occurs all the way up from Somalia uh, down into Mozambique, uh, and then South Africa is the most southern population. And if we zoom into, into the South African population, uh, I'm just showing you on the screen there, uh, the Sabap 2 pentads uh, where they are seen. So Sabap 2 is the South African Bird Atlasing Project, uh, which is a citizen science project to which you can uh, contribute as well. And each one of those squares is a pentad. And it pretty much shows you how often uh, the birds are seen within those blocks. And those are the blocks they're seen in. You'll see that uh, they're mostly seen here around Isimagulisu, Wetland Park, as well as Susluwe and, and, and St. Lucia. Um, and that is uh, pretty much uh, the area we expect to find them. Um, and like I said, they are forest specialists. So they occupy this ecotone between coastal evergreen forests and lowland grasslands. Um, now this at the back here, sort of your evergreen forest with the more open grasslands in front of the screen. And when I say ecotone, I pretty much mean the transitioning line between these two habitats. And what they, these birds do is they breed and roost in the forest. So you, there you can see on the left, the bird hiding from the midday sun. Um, in, uh, in the forest. Uh, and on the right, you can see some very rare photographs of uh, a breeding snake eagle. These are some of the only photographs uh, of a nest site in, uh, that's been recorded in Southern Africa. And what they do in the grasslands is that they hunt in these open spaces and they're mostly targeting reptiles, amphibians, and of course, snakes. Uh, this constitutes roughly 80% of their diet. Um, and they're perch hunters. So they'll come to the edge of the forest, sit on these dead snags and scan the area for potential prey. Being raptors, they of course have very good eyesight. And once they see their prey, they'll swoop down uh, and grab it. You can see the bottom one there has uh, caught a frog where the top right one has caught a vine snake and it's dispatching its head before eating the rest of the body. Uh, and these vine snakes apparently make up the majority of their diet was pretty much a favored prey. And why are we interested in them? Well, of course, they're beautiful birds. So they're, inherent, they're also inherently, inherently interesting. Um, but bird, fly, bird life is looking at them because of uh, their conservation status. Uh, so like I said, they are regionally critically endangered. Um, and they have a declining population and geographic range. Um, and current estimates is that there are fewer than 50 mature individuals. So, I mean, if you look, those are 50 dots on the screen there. That's, that's a handful of birds. Um, also, globally, they are only listed as near threatened. Um, but this last assessment was, uh, they last got their category in 2004. So there's a real need to review this conservation status and um, they have a declining population and geographic range globally. Um, so yeah, a real need to review this. Um, and part of the reason they are declining is uh, due to habitat loss, one of the big threats to the species. Uh, you'll see on the right there, that's showing forest cover loss in Africa uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, all the pink areas is where forest has been lost. Um, and apparently more than 50% of Africa's forest has been lost. Uh, this is due to a study by, um, uh, according to a study by Hansen et al. 
And a lot of this has been transformation for, for instance, agriculture and human settlement. And you can see within the seven band snake eagles range there that a lot of this has also been happening in Tanzania and Mozambique. Um, but if we look at uh, uh, the northern KwaZulu Natal, or, the KwaZulu, or if we look at KwaZulu Natal province and we look at habitat loss, um, you'll see on the left there all the black areas is anthropogenically transformed habitat. Uh, and in 1994, uh, we had 73% of northern KwaZulu-Natal was uh, natural habitat. But by 2011, we only had 53% natural habitat left. And of course, uh, with expanding population, uh, this is probably only going to get worse. You also see that a lot of this transformation is happening along the coastline, which is where we expect to find our snake eagles. Uh, and a lot of this is due to transformation to things like sugarcane and plantations uh, and uh, just human settlement expansion. So another threat to the species is electrocution. Um, as you can see there, these birds like to perch uh, on power line infrastructure, as this is a good spot for them to hunt from. And the bird in the top left there, is very, very close to a live wire. You see that a cable arcing above it, uh, that's actually a live wire, so that bird is very close to going up in smoke. And uh, part of the reason this is, a, or why they're susceptible, is also due to the fact that they're snake eagles. As you can see on the right there, that snake that he's caught is, that's hanging there, that's pretty much a nice conductor rod. Uh, so if that makes contact with any of the live wires, uh, that snake eagle will get shocked as well. And um, yeah, that's why we started the Southern Band Snake Eagle. And we started it with some preliminary or exploratory investigations. Uh, firstly, in 2015, uh, a team led by Dr. Andrew Jenkins and David Allen went down into Northern Cuisine and Seoul um, to understand the landscape, identify role players, and to pretty much build a network for the project going forward. Then in 2016, Dr. Shane McPherson was hired as a full-time researcher on the project. Uh, and he surveyed Mutazini, uh, which is about two hours north from Durban, and is also believed to be one of the hotspots for these birds. And uh, Shane had some uh, groundbreaking discoveries. Uh, for instance, he uh, discovered the fourth ever recorded nest for Southern Man snake eagles uh, in Southern Africa. And you can see how difficult this task is. Uh, the nest is in that spot there, um, as well as the bird being highlighted on the nest uh, in the top picture there. Uh, quite difficult to spot. But the groundbreaking part of it was that he discovered this nest in sort of this forestry landscape. You can see with these slivers of natural pockets of forest, but mostly in a sea of otherwise plantations. Um, and this was uh, interesting because uh, before this, we sort of thought that these birds were restricted to protected areas. Uh, and this presented us with the idea that perhaps these forestry landscapes can be substitute habitat for the species. So the project was then handed over to Dr. Melissa Whitecross, who had uh, my position and has since uh, moved up in the ranks of birdlife. Uh, but then uh, overall project plan and aims was drafted. Um, and this included firstly identifying where these birds are. So we wanted to produce uh, a regional distribution map, a fine scale one. Uh, and to do this, we did some species distribution modeling and we're also investigating habitat use and movement. And the information we need to do these types of analysis is citizen science data, occurrence, which uh, constitutes occurrence data. Uh, we need to do some telemetry studies, which basically entails tracking the birds and seeing how they move. We're doing some surveying. We are conducting annual surveys, which I'll tell you about a little bit later and everyone can get involved in that, uh, as well as some GIS work or remote sensing, um, looking at habitat and habitat loss. Uh, and this all feeds into to, uh, get to uh, answering the question, that question, where are they? And our second question is how many are left? Um, and we are looking to produce a robust national population estimate 
Um, and of course, this will also help us monitor uh, the impact of our conservation initiatives. Uh, and the previous data I discussed or information will feed into that, but also we need information on breeding biology, um, as well as looking at the threats to these birds. And uh, to do this, uh, we'll look at using some camera traps uh, to look both at breeding biology as well as on some of these threatening structures, um, as well as to do an audit of uh, electrical infrastructure um, and uh, to look at habitat loss uh, as well and quantifying that. And all of this will feed into pretty much answering those questions and then allowing us to give some habitat management guidelines for both the forestry industry and it's gone. So first off, uh, the species distribution models. Uh, I told you about the citizen science data. So you can see there in the middle, uh, we correlated data from Birdlasser, um, from the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, from eBird, and from African Raptor Data Bank. Um, and all this information was then cleaned, errors were sorted out, and biases were removed. And on the left there, you can see our, our occurrence data, each one of those white dots indicating uh, uh, where we know snake eagles occur. So then we collected a range of environmental variables, uh, starting with some climate variables, uh, things like minimum temperature in winter, maximum temperature in summer, rainfall, that type of thing. Uh, we also got some information on topography, things like slope, altitude, that type of thing. And then we looked at land cover, so soil type as well as land use. And all of this information is then used to, to build a species distribution model. And without getting too technical, basically what the model does is it looks at each one of those points where we, we know some man snake eagles occur. And it, it looks at what the prevailing uh, environmental conditions are at these sites. And then it predicts at other sites how likely it is uh, that it's suitable habitat for uh, southern man snake eagles. And what we do is we use 80% of the occurrence data uh, to train the model, and then we use 20% that's been retained just to assess how well it predicts occurrence. But of course, not all of these variables are very important to southern man snake eagles. Um, so we remove the ones from the model that aren't having a big effect. Uh, just to refine our model. And then we get an output such as you see there on the right, which is a very fine scale model. It's a 30 meter resolution model with the blue areas indicating the most uh, suitable habitat for the species. And if we delve a little bit deeper, deeper into the model uh, and look at what variables were most important, well, the minimum temperature of the coldest month was the most important predictor uh, for suitable habitat for the species. So basically indicating that these birds are choosing air, warm areas um, and they stay away from the colder areas. Uh, and of course, land cover was also quite important. Uh, Robin Collin from BirdLife South Africa uh, then also did a global model for the species to look at its, uh, its uh, potential suitable habitat uh, across Africa at a little bit of a, of a coarser scale, a 100 meter resolution, and the results are there on the right, uh, with the more orange -ready, reddish areas being the most suitable areas as predicted by the model. What was interesting, if we look more closely at our South African model, is that you'll see there on the left, those encircled areas um, came up as quite blue areas, which means they were seen as quite suitable by the model. And if you look on the right, uh, the purple areas indicated on the right, are that's all forestry, forest blocks and plantations. Um, so interesting that our model is highlighting those. Uh, and building on that and the findings by Dr. Shane McPherson, uh, we uh, did a, a, a little bit of a ground truthing mission. Uh, so Dr. Melissa Whitecross went down with a team to the area. You can see there the yellow bits is where they surveyed and they looked at these forest blocks areas and searched for seven man snake eagles. They uh, pretty much did this with callbacks. So every 500 meters, they played a call and tried to elicit the response from a seven man snake eagle. And the findings were quite interesting. Um, 
generally people thought that these plantation areas were quite poor in species diversity. Um, but uh, Melissa then managed to survey 22 pentads of the set of two uh, pentads, and uh, they found 257 different bird species. And you can see some of them on the left there. Also, interestingly, they found a wide variety of raptors in this landscape, which is the, this list in the middle there. Um, and most interestingly of all, they found five different um, territories, seven banded snake eagle territories, just in this one forest block. And those territories are indicated by these yellow circles and the yellow stars. And of course, this means that uh, gives us further evidence that the seven banded snake eagles are persisting in this landscape. And that we really need to engage with Sapi and Mondi and pretty much forestry uh, South Africa to ensure that um, you know, these, these areas are, are well managed and stay suitable for the species. We also wanted to understand how the species is using this uh, transformed landscape and how they managed to adapt to it. Uh, so we started a telemetry study um, and um, this entails uh, pretty much fixing them with GPS devices, as you can see on the screen there. And uh, yeah, Melissa and the team managed to uh, deploy devices on the first two seven banded snake eagles that have ever been tracked. Uh, and this is what I'm going to show you next. And over there, you see on the right the first ever uh, movement data on the species. Uh, so that's quite exciting. They managed to track both a male and a female bird. Um, and you can, you'll see that they stick within quite a narrow and small territories. They don't seem to move outside them. But if you zoom in on the male's data, um, you'll see that the male is, is very much within an a anthropogenic landscape. You can see that's Muntazini town itself, uh, and he's venturing into there. And if you zoom in further, you can see that part of his habitat is using sort of this natural forest and some of these planted trees. But to the right, we've got some mining, and to the left, we have intensive agriculture. So a lot of habitat transformation has been happening in the area. And uh, we decided we wanted to quantify this to inform um, the, the review of the conservation status of the species, which is happening later this year and is being done by the BirdLife International Red List team. So what we did is we took our species distribution model, which you see in the middle there, and we quantified forest loss uh, at different tiers of a model of, yeah. And the forest loss is indicated in the red there in the middle. Uh, and that's according to Hansen and all uh, the study I mentioned previously. And what we basically did is look at different tiers. So if we look at the more than 80% uh, probability of occurrence or habitat suitability, depending on how you wanna uh, think about it. Um, but in that more than 80% probability habitat, um, almost 19% uh, of their habitat has um, been lost in the last 20 years. And this is also very much an underestimate because our model doesn't account land, land use, this global model. So that percentage is very much the lower minimum. And of course, this is a little bit concerning. Um, and uh, if we zoom into South Africa, you'll see that pretty much their prime habitat in South Africa is a huge red patch there, um, which uh, constitutes uh, a lot of forest loss. So it becomes even more important for us to engage with uh, forestry, uh, South Africa, uh, with the forestry industry to conserve sort of these natural pockets of forest in the matrix of plantations. And uh, sort of trying to figure out uh, what the mechanisms are for their persistence in this habitat. Uh, and it might be that we're engineering uh, a lot of their habitat requirements uh, you can see here in the middle of the screen a, a, a road passing through the area and a young stand of trees at the back there, but very much an open habitat in the center of the screen, which is suitable hunting for them. And then to the back left, you have some plantation trees, which they can roost in, and these convenient poles along the road uh, of the power lines, uh, which they can use for hunting. So potentially it's substitute habitat, but um, if it is habitat that 
they're going to be using, then it needs to be safe. And the real danger in this landscape is transformer boxes. Um, and um, the problem with transformer boxes is that they have these uh, jumper cables that are live wires uh, that you can see there uh, encircled on the screen um, that uh, uh, go up from the transformer box to that cross beam. And um, it's uh, had, uh, we've recorded quite a few executions of band snake eagles, uh, such as this bird in the bottom right corner here, which is a first year bird. Um, and in total, we've uh, recorded four um, incidences. Uh, I say we, what I mean is the Endangered Wildlife Trust uh, who run an incidence uh, database. And um, they also collaborate closely with uh, the ESCOM uh, to mitigate such threats. And you can see in the middle of the screen there, uh, the, the, electric the electrocutions have been indicated. You can see one up here by um, the border with Mozambique, and then three have happened down here near St. Lucia to uh, the same transformer box. So we wanted to quantify this threat and uh, Melissa Whitecross uh, did sort of a threat analysis on these transformer boxes, uh, which the result of you can see in the center there. Uh, with the larger red dots being the more critical or more threatening transformer boxes, um, all the way down to the small yellow dots, which are less, uh, less threatening to the species or to electrocutions. But what she did is she basically used our species distribution model and she looked at what transformer boxes were inside a highly suitable habitat, as well as inside uh, protected areas. And those were considered uh, the most dangerous to the species. And then those that are inside the range, but outside the protected area were considered less important and so on. And uh, she came up with uh, roughly 21 uh, critical uh, uh, transformer boxes, as well as a further 104. Uh, that were also quite important. And she presented this work uh, at the African Conference for Linear Infrastructure Ecology to a room full of fellow ecologists, as well as various industry role players, and notably two ESCOM executives. Um, and they approached her after the talk um, and uh, expressed um, their intention to, to immediately start working at mitigating this threat. threat. And uh, with Melissa's guidance, they managed to um, very quickly uh, insulate these jumper cables in um, roughly 62 transformer boxes. Uh, as you can see, uh, there there's the exposed cables with live wire and there they've been insulated. Uh, so through this action, they've pretty much uh, nullified this threat uh, in the core of the South African range of the species across a large area. And uh, just to sort of give you a time, timeline and to show you what effective mitigation looks like and um, hats off to ESCOM for responding so quickly. Um, so in March uh, 2019, Melissa uh, presented those results at the conference. Uh, then there were various meetings, but by November, November of 2019, ESCOM had mitigated uh, this threat in 94% of the high risk transformer boxes. And this is also partly due to, to the great partnership we have in the Angula partnership, uh, which is a partnership between the Middle Print Wetland Trust, ESCOM and BirdLife South Africa, uh, that has seen various con conservation successes. And we hope to continue that great collaboration into the future. Um, but uh, yeah, we want to uh, investigate further ways to mitigate this threat for the seven band snake eagle and look at various ways to, for instance, uh, discourage them from perching uh, on transformer boxes. Uh, and for this, we're collaborating with the Magula Ground Hornbill Project. Uh, I know a lot of you may have seen uh, the great talk by uh, Dr. Lucy Kemp. Uh, so we work with them and um, going to do some studies as uh, under ground hornbills, which will be transferable to the Southern Man Snake Eagles uh, because the Southern Ground Hornbill also uh, has uh, a tendency to get uh, electrocuted by these transformer boxes. 
So just looking ahead, uh, what we're still planning. So we plan to close these all these knowledge gaps that I've discussed in the talk uh, through using things like uh, more telemetry studies, uh, looking at uh, placing some camera traps on nest sites, as well as in investigating the threats of transform boxes. And also through ground truthing, uh, a lot of our species distribution model, uh, as well as getting to that uh, population estimates through our annual surveys. And yes, that will allow us to accurately delineate uh, the available habitat for the species, as well as getting those scientifically informed population estimates. And this will all feed into uh, reviewing the global red list status for the species. So looking at how you can uh, help and get involved, some of you might be quite enthusiastic to get involved in Sun Band and Snake Eagle uh, conservation after this talk. Well, we're planning to host the an annual um, survey called the Zululand Snake Eagle Big Day. And this will pretty much entail a lot of citizen scientists um, and uh, uh, bird watchers going out uh, over the time, the same weekend and surveying as large uh, uh, area as possible uh, throughout the range of the Southern Banded Eagle so that we can sort of get a, within a single time stamp, uh, get an idea of where all these Southern Banded Snake Eagles are. It will also involve a bit more formal um, resampling of the same uh, survey that Melissa and them have done uh, previously. Uh, so I very much encourage everyone to join us uh, and uh, go on a hunt for seven band snake eagles uh, at the end of this year. Um, if you want more information, it will be on our website uh, in the coming months. Um, and what uh, you also could do in general is to use bird lasso, uh, which is pretty much a, a application which you can use on your phone to log the birds you see. Um, when you do that, please just make sure to go to the causes and then sign up you can sign up to all the causes, but uh, there's a Bird Life South Africa Threatened Species cause. And if you sign up to that, it will allow us to use your data in a lot of our science, such as, such as the, what I've presented to you tonight. Um, um, so you can contribute in that way. And um, then you can just go out and start logging birds and having fun. And yeah, please just try and log the birds where you see them. You can even drag that uh, pinpoint to to be closer to where you actually see the bird, the greater accuracy we have there, the better the science we do. Then of course, you can also donate to BirdLife South Africa uh, using the Southern Band Snake Eagle project as reference. Uh, you can look at our donations page on our website. And then of course, there's a lot of people to thank and a lot of organizations that have been involved. Um, and I also personally have to thank uh, Melissa Whitecross. She allowed me to refurbish a lot of her slides. Uh, so thank you very much, Melissa, and uh, thank you to the audience. And uh, I hope everyone has uh, enjoyed the talk and is enthusiastic about uh, Southern Bend Snake Eagle conservation. Christian, um, I will email you tomorrow. We have a property on the Imsonani River, um, 200 okay. hectares um, bordering Pinda. Um, okay. I know We've got a nesting site. Great. Uh, and um, we also have three or four transformer boxes on the farm. <laughs> and I okay. don't know if they have been protected or not. So I'd like somebody to um, help me get that sorted out. Excellent. Yeah, please, please do, Bruce. Uh, we're also looking for extra nests or just snake eagles in general, because we, we definitely want to branch out or increase our sample size for our telemetry study. Uh, yep. But yeah, please, please send me that email. Great. Thanks. Okay, cool. Okay. We've also got accommodation on the farm, a lodge. Um, so if we can use that for the, the birding at the end of the year, um, we can chat about that as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris John, for the very interesting talk. I've got a few questions, if I can. Uh, normally, when there's not many hands up, I, I get to ask more than one. So, <laughs> um, I, I just, you know, thanks. Very interesting. You you mentioned a lot, um, sort of exotic plantations and that sort of thing. And I've seen, you know, similar with long crested eagles. And there's quite a few um, raptors that make use of those. But I was just wondering, what is the impact of sugarcane farming on the southern banded uh, snake eagle? Considering that uh, 
cane farms are actually renowned for hosting a hang of a lot of snakes. So I was just mm. wondering if, if that is, um, you know, if, if that is habitat destruction or if there's inadvertently a food source in the cane fields. Mm. The food question. So um, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I would uh, I would guess that uh, probably no. Um, I think these sugar cane farms are quite large areas. If there's pockets of natural forest that the birds can breed in, then theoretically they can uh, start a little territory there. Um, I just don't know about the cane fields. I know that uh, when you have sort of mature cane fields, that it's not really open habitat. Uh, so I don't know how effectively they'll be able to hunt in sort of those larger cane um, uh, cane stands, uh, and they'll need those open areas to to do the hunting. Um, so my guess would be it just constitutes habitat loss, um, if I had to guess. Yeah, because I mean that whole area of the KZN coast is full of the mm. full of pen, So yeah. They, they, yeah I Sorry, Sorry, I actually had a map that I took out that that also showed pretty much plantations and sugarcane and exactly where it was. But yeah, it it's wasn't in the talk, but I could perhaps send it to you if you were interested. And then you mentioned the vine snake being a favorite uh, or favorite uh, snake species. Um, do they, I mean, th that's quite interesting because I, I, I think that the, the vine snake is actually the most venomous type of venom of any snake more than a bomb slung or, or any others as far as I know so it's quite interesting that they would choose that one specifically and I'm just interested is it the size of the vine snake because they're quite small um, and what is the biggest snake that a, a southern banded a snake eagle can take up? Okay so yeah here we come with the difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure I just uh, I've heard that the vine snake uh, is sort of a preferred prey. I don't know why that is. Uh, my guess would just be that they are pretty much a species that's quite, uh, is around a lot and perhaps its behavior makes it a bit more conspicuous, so easier for them to catch. Um, and in terms of size of snakes that they'll take down, I'm not sure. It's one of the smaller snake eagles. Um, so I don't know. Like I said, not that much has been done in the species. Hopefully if we we get those nest cameras up. We can, uh, I don't know, see see them bring it back like a, a something big, like a black mamba or something. And then I have a I have an answer for you there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what the the, the biggest size is that uh, that they would be able to catch. Uh, they weigh roughly a kilogram. Um, the seven man snake eagles themselves. Um, but yeah, if if that helps. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, the Western uh, banded snake eel, in comparison, uh, there's a number of questions one can ask about that. But the first mm -hmm. one, just two, just two, then maybe. Uh, I'm not sure what their status is, and and then the second question would be: Has anything been done on them, just in comparison? Because they also have a long, narrow distribution, mm -hmm. but it's up in the riparian areas up in the in the north uh, arid areas and also uh, on tuesday there was a talk on on uh, climate change and birds up in the north northwestern parts of the country and the effects of climate change and uh, to what extent would climate change have an effect possibly on the, those birds in the riparian zones up in the in the northwest because i'm pretty sure that those riparian zones aren't quite as dense as the coastal zone on, along the southern parts, or at least the eastern parts of the country. Mm. Um, yeah, so in terms of climate change, luckily for the southern band snake eagle, they, they have sort of this longitudinal uh, distribution. And us being the more southern, um, southern uh, part of that range means they're likely to be able to shift down a little bit. So yeah. we're doing, we'll probably be, uh, fine in terms of climate change and the this, uh, this species' distribution in terms of the seven band snake eagles. Uh, the reason we're also not working on the western is um, because BirdLife South Africa sort of focuses more locally on South Africa. We often go beyond our borders, uh, but we do try a little bit uh, to focus within South Africa, which is why we haven't considered working on the western um, one. Um, in terms of its conservation status, I don't actually know, but I am guessing that it's also probably similar to the southern banded, either being near threatened or less, 
um, it's also likely that it's data deficient because judging by how little we know about the southern band snake eagle, I am guessing that the same would be true for the western band snake eagle. Um, yeah, yeah, at best, yeah. At, at best, near threatened, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. So, Christian, it's it's really interesting. Um, do you think that there's been an impact on the species because of, you know, less snakes, less amphibians, less fro you know frogs, that type of thing? Um, because they, I mean, I can't imagine those populations are doing that well either. That's an interesting question. I actually have no idea how those populations are doing. Um, I'm just trying to think there might have, there might be a lot of areas where they, they, the numbers have gone down. But uh, with a lot of these um, species, such as amphibians and stuff, they, they're able to, to reproduce quite quickly. Um, so I don't know if food availability is having an impact on these snake eagles. Um, it may, um, but like I said, I'm, I'm not really aware of studies assessing that, um, especially in that region. It is a quite a productive region. Um, and these amphibians, I mean, and reptiles are able to use all of these sort of micro habitats. Um, so they need less space basically to breed and, and, and that type of thing. Um, but it may be an issue. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's worth assessing. It may be something we'll be able to pick up if we look at our camera traps on their sites and look at sort of um, the rates at which, they've, which they're feeding the chick and how much, or how much food they are bringing back to the nest. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I see your area is very close to where my heart is and that's in Dumo Game Reserve. So um, that's also northern Maputo land. Um, I haven't personally seen um, one of these uh, birds out there, but I presume they are there. So I'm going to make my eco warriors very aware of the species and try and see whether we can actually start spotting them, especially around Naimiti Pan and closer to the homesteads. But what I want to ask, is there any traditional beliefs that are linked to this species? Uh, thanks, Cheryl. Um, that that would be great. I mean, like you, you probably you saw that sabap, all the pentads that we know they occur with, and it's always great if uh, we can have new recordings at uh, new sites uh, and identify potentially new areas. Like I said, it's quite a cryptic species, so uh, you know there may be smaller populations or territories that we don't know about. So that would be great. Thank you very much for the offer. Um, in terms of beliefs, I'm sorry, I have no idea. Um, I don't know of any beliefs um, regarding snake gonna, eagles specifically. All right, I'm going to try and ask a few questions out in the community to see whether that could also be one of the reasons why, why their numbers are low. Thanks. I'll have a chat with them. But Thank yeah, you very much. It, pertaining to electricity, yes, there are some hotspots, but otherwise, yeah, we out there with candlelight. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Yeah, sorry, Christian, another question. Um, you, when you looked at the ESCOM and the um, electrocutions, is that the same issues that vultures have? Um, or do vultures have an issue more with those big power lines where their wings like overlap from one line to the other? Yeah, I think with vultures, uh, the larger power lines are a big issue, as well as some of uh, these, uh, you know, the small power lines as well. But um, as far as I know, the, the transformer boxes aren't used that often by the vultures. Uh, I mean, conceptually, all of these structures uh, are a bit of an issue for any birds that can perch on them uh, in the ones that haven't been mitigated. Um, but yeah, um, the, there are definitely some vultures getting uh, electrocuted on these lower sort of standard size um, power lines as well. I I personally uh, found some carcasses, I think it was three vultures and a tawny eagle um, that was just a simple small power line um, going through a farm, you know, the typical, you know, one story height uh, type power lines, um, two meter pole type thing. So it definitely does happen as well. Uh, in terms of these power boxes, transform boxes, I'm, I'm not that sure. Um, I think they, they're more generally getting hit by these larger power lines and 
you know, the, the pole part line sale. Yeah. And do you think that you um, established a, a good dialogue with the, the two executives at ESCOM that can be built upon or was it just like a one time event? Yeah, so we, we actually work very closely with uh, ESCOM. They're part of the Angula partnership. So they're very uh, involved in a range of our um, conservation um, initiatives. Um, and we work quite closely with the environmental team and they are, are very hard working and keen to, to mitigate the effects uh, ESCOM has, sort of their environmental outfall. Uh, so it's definitely not a one-time thing. ESCOM has, um, for a long time, this partnership is going back to 2004. Uh, they've been involved in, and uh, working hard to to improve sort of, um, like I said, the environmental impacts of their activities. Definitely not a one-time thing. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much. Pleasure.